Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show Mr. David Morgan. David is a precious metals expert. He holds degrees in both finance and engineering. He is the publisher of the Morgan Report, where he specializes in money, metals and mining. David has been featured everywhere from CNBC to Fox Business News to the Wall Street Journal. We're excited to have him here today to get his perspective upon the silver short squeeze that is happening right in front of our eyes. David, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm doing quite well and uh, pretty busy as you would expect. I normally do maybe three interviews a week and uh, I think I've been averaging about three or four a day now, but it's great. I'm, I'm happy to be with you. Excellent. You know, it's understandable because what is happening right now is so exciting. We are in a very um, tremendous situation because right now, precious metals are being affected by the Reddit gang, which, of course, is outside the Wall Street banking, and they are causing a silver short squeeze for the first time on record. Let's start off, David, by explaining to everyone the details of the overall situation of what is happening right now and how. Please begin with the definition of a short squeeze when it comes to silver. Well, I'm going to do it with GameStop, I think, first. It's easier to understand, then we'll move to silver, if you don't mind, Michelle. But on GameStop, the, it's a stock. It's a um, game. Uh, I, there's one in our mall. I don't know if it's there anymore. I don't know much about the company, but I know that 140% of the shares outstanding were shorted. Uh, and, well, people say, how can you short more than 100%, right? And the answer is there's the options market, and you can. So it was a tight float, 50 million shares. So any buying pressure drives the price higher and the people on Wall Street bets know that and the Reddit subgroup, they know that. So they start buying, buying, buying. And on a short squeeze, the people that are short have to buy to cover selling, you know, to, to cover their position. In other words, to get out of the, the squeeze. And so I, I don't remember, I don't know the numbers. I actually haven't looked at it in detail, but I know the, the fundamentals. And so as the stock went higher and higher and higher, some of these hedge funds really had to buy at a very high price to cover their short. And that caused the price to go even higher. And so, you know, selling what you don't own can be very painful at times. That's why short selling is usually done by professionals only. And usually they have stops in, you know, once I sell it at 10 and it goes to 12, I'll buy it back, cover my short and take the loss. But in a really fast market, and if you have a big position, it's could be kind of difficult to get out of. So moving to silver, it's different because silver is a commodity. And because it's a commodity, first of all, it's on a different exchange. Secondly, there's tons of derivatives around the commodity. You've got uh, options, options and futures, futures options. You've got ETFs. You've got private over-the-counter the, over derivatives where you've again got the same type of things meaning options, features, private contracts, forwards. There's all kinds of things that go on. So there's multiple vectors off of the commodity that you don't have in something like GameStop, which means there's a lot of ways to dilute the money that funnels into that asset. However, having said that, it looks like this uh, Reddit group, Wall Street Bets, I don't know who to give credit to, look, knows what they're doing. The SLV purportedly buys physical silver to, to, um, when you buy shares. Each share is worth, I think, 0.92% uh, of, uh, of an ounce. In other words, one share doesn't equal one ounce. One share equals about uh, 0.92 ounces, almost an ounce, 92% of an ounce, somewhere in that range. Anyway, the point being is, over the last three or four trading days, Michelle, roughly 100 million ounces of physical silver has been bought via the SLV. The PSLV, the physical trust, has uh, reported they just put in 6.4 million ounces into their trust. And if I remember correctly, the uh, 
shelf filing on the PSLV is $1.5 billion. I'm not saying they're going to do it all. I have no idea. But uh, there is potentially more firepower from that side. And then if you go into the retail market, it's basically ICE-9, you know, what Jim Rickards likes to refer to, it's frozen. Not quite. I'm exaggerating a little for effect. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm just being truthful. It's very difficult to find retail product, especially in size. And what you do find has got huge premiums on it, which isn't that unusual in a tight market. We've seen it before. We saw it in 2008. We saw it in 2011. We saw it from about March on of last year. Uh, the premiums went sky high when silver touched that $12 paper price and stayed I'll call it sky high for several months. Then it started to come back and normalize, but not for very long. And before this quote unquote short squeeze started, one of my dealer's friends and I were having our normal chit chat. And he said, David, do you know how uh, tight the market is right now? And again, this is a few weeks ago. And I said, no, I thought it kind of loosened up. It was pretty much back to normal. He goes, no, it's about a four week wait on just silver rounds right now. And that was way before this happened. So short squeeze, uh, I just did a previous interview, Michelle. Is it going to absolutely take place? It's taking place. Will it go to fruition where it ends like GameStop? I have my doubts. There's mining companies out there that uh, not even primary silver miners. I doubt First Majestic is going to sell forward or uh, write options or, or <clears throat> forwards against their position, although they might, but more like your RTZs, your big conglomerates that mine a lot of silver, but it's a minuscule part of their overall uh, income statement. They'd be probably more than happy to write off a uh, substantial amount of, sil of their silver production, if not all of it, or two years of it, or three years of it at, let's say, $50 an ounce. I'm just giving you the idea. I don't know what price, but it would be, and that could, imp that will impact the market, how much would have to be determined. The point being is that isn't a naked short. That would be uh, a mining company that produces silver. They're just selling into the current market at a given price and locking in that price and then deliver into the physical market in the future. So there's that. So there's, that doesn't happen in GameStop. So there is, you know, more difficulty, let's say, plus the way the futures market is designed, everything about the futures market favors the shorts. The shorts don't have to put up as much margin as the longs do. The shorts are considered to be, uh, commercial producers, although they aren't, they're banks, but they have to put up 30% less margin than someone going long. Even a professional going long has to put up, you know, the minimum, the full margin that the uh, CME requires. And then they, of course, they increased uh, margin requirements, uh, what, two days ago? And uh, it was 18% on the CME, which meant that a lot of the brokers was increased their margins greater than that. Maybe they doubled it. Maybe they tripled it. I don't know. It depends on the broker. They can set what they want. And that, of course, forces out the people that don't are thin margined, that don't have cash ready available to hold their positions. And their positions get sold out pretty quickly, which puts a lot of selling pressure on. We're kind of working through that right now as we're doing the interview. But it's not over, and and I'll, in quotation marks, the squeeze is ongoing. Again, whether it will be fulfilled and come to fruition like we saw with GameStop, I have my doubts, but I wouldn't say no. It can happen. There is no doubt that it could happen. Uh, it got close during the Hunt Brothers days. They changed the rules, said you could only sell. Um, but last time it got very frothy, when we were going parabolic in silver was in 2011, all through the month of April, just kept going higher and higher and higher. The margin requirements got increased and increased again, increased another time and increased one more time. I think they increased the margin requirements four or five times on that run. So that's usually what takes place. That usually stops the market. But these GameStop types are smart. They know that you buy low, sell high. I mean, buying under 30 for the long term, I think is a good price. I mean, if you asked me a couple of years ago, I said, buy all you can under 20, you know, 
But under 30, you're probably pretty safe, in my opinion. And if it goes to who knows, you know, 50, I think that's kind of a minimum over the next uh, period of time, whatever period you want to take. It's not a week, it's not a month. Probably might be this year. I said 40 this year, but I think that's pretty much in the bag now. We'll see. But over the longer term, I've always said $100 silver, and that's kind of at a minimum. And that's, uh, I said that in 2002 or 2003. So back to you. I'm sure you have more questions. Well, you know, it's just a fascinating perspective from the, um, the viewpoint of the average person, you know, who's not an institutional investor, because what this amounts to is a large group of private citizens purchasing silver, which caused the price to rise. And what it did was turn the tables on the behind the scenes game that the banks play in controlling and manipulating the price of silver for their own financial profits and leaving everybody else out. So it's real interesting that once it starts to rise and people start to invest in other stocks too, you know, whether it's First Majestic or GameStop or whatever it is, um, they elevated, you know, the margins. And what that means is that average people went from Thursday, they could go in and they could buy First Majestic at 12 bucks or 15 bucks or whatever it was at that time. But the very next day, they can't because they don't have the adequate margins in place. Only the institutional investors do. And my point to this is they still have that control and manipulation. They go in and say, oh, we're safeguarding everyone. But really what they're doing is locking out the little guy from taking advantage of this. True. But there is a little bit of an advantage to silver that I didn't mention. I talked about a lot of the issues that you don't have with the stock. But the beauty about silver is you don't need a brokerage account. So everybody that partook in the GameStop situation had to have a brokerage account silver you don't any person could call up a dealer over the phone or walk in uh in their local town if they have a dealer or get on the internet and put in an order and that's it so you know it's not the big uh, fill out all these papers let us get them approved let's send it back to you give you an account number here's where you open it none of that it's like a phone call and you bought silver it's like the simplest thing to do is to buy precious metals. So that's an advantage. The only, I'll call it disadvantage is the wait time. You know, people, especially if they're buying the first time, you know, they put in their hundred bucks or thousand bucks or 10,000 bucks or 150,000 or 500,000, whatever their order is. And that four weeks seems like four months. <laughs> I mean, it's just the way human nature works. How am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? And of course you do very little difficulty in this market, especially if you use a dealer that's been around for you know five years or more. It's it, some fail. Uh, one thing, if I could just stop and digress for a moment, Michelle, uh, if you are interested, meaning the viewing audience about silver market, please take a two minute read of 10 rules of silver investing that I wrote like two decades ago. It'll save you a lot of problems. It'll answer a lot of questions. I wrote it rather pithy. It's called 10 Rules of Silver Investing, and you'll probably get it with that search. But if it doesn't come up, put in 10 Rules of Silver Investing by David Morgan. And there's all ads at the top now on the search engine. Scroll down, but it should be one of the first uh, URLs that isn't an ad. So I just wanted to get that in there because it answers a lot of questions that are very basic, but very important for people to know, especially if they're new or have only bought one or two times or we're going to buy for the first time. It sure does. It was great for me reading through it because you don't know what you don't know. You know, I mean, you don't realize that you don't know something. And so when you read through something and it is very basic, but that's the beauty of it. Um, I want to talk about the definition of naked short selling. You mentioned that term and, um, that's primarily the way that the Wall Street bankers make a lot of their money, not just in precious metals and stocks and so on and so forth. How has this um, short squeeze that was created by the public 
affected the banks in terms of their naked short selling? And also, please give a definition for everyone of what it is. All right. Well, first of all, let's talk about covered shorts. And that would be what I already outlined where a major banking, or excuse me, a major uh, mining company, uh, for example, or maybe a refiner or a smelter, someone that has a physical will sell in advance. So they'll sell, you know, six months out, but they have the product either at hand or in the future that they can deliver. So that would be a covered short. A naked short would be one that doesn't have the product and they're just selling and the only, and you have to have something to sell against. So a naked short is not totally naked. What does that mean, David? It means they have to have cash in the account. So if I'm going to sell silver short and I don't have any silver, uh, I have to have a certain amount of money in my account. And this is where this margin things come into effect because as the market starts moving against the shorts, then the, uh, the authorities will call them, say, hey, this market isn't working out too good for you selling something you don't have. So pony up more dollars or more you know, currency, throw more currency in your account. And of course that happens. And uh, you know, the thing about silver, in my opinion, is that these guys have won so long for so often for almost every trade from the short side. The rules are written in favor of the shorts, but as I said a moment ago, you know, the advantage of silver is you can just make a phone call and buy it physically. But they're so used to it. They're, in my view, kind of arrogant about it, and they have the exchange on their side, and all this stuff works in their favor. But what the one thing that's so truthful is – it's bad news at some times in history to sell what you don't own. And, you know, that's a naked short. You're, you've got the cash, but cash doesn't equal silver. The other part of silver that makes it unique from my perspective, and I think a lot of people agree with me, is that if the public and institutional physical investors in silver take enough and hold on to it, now the industrial side has a problem. They'll call up their dealer, their smelter, their refiner, whomever they have their relationship with. It's usually a commercial entity that does a commercial silver product. And there's not that many of them, but they exist with mesh and shot and wire and all kinds of different forms for commercial silver industry. And they will be told you got to wait four weeks or whatever. They're usually probably buy you know a month out in the shell. But if they're used to buying a month out and call up and say, hey, we need it four weeks from now, and says, <laughs> sorry about that. It's going to be eight or can't make it. Well, we'll pay more. We'll pay over spot. We want it now. Sorry about that. You know, it's 12 weeks or whatever. So my point being, and I hope I'm making it clear that if, and I believe it could happen, where the retail and institutional types that are silver bulls and, and telling the banks, you know, we're tired of your nonsense, uh, spills over into the industrial side, you could see some, potentially you could see some more fireworks. And that would be very interesting to see, you know, uh, an Apple or Tesla or you know, Mitsubishi or Dow Chemical or DuPont or, 3M or somebody come out and say, we have delayed the pro we have delayed this product due to the silver shortage. You know, that would be interesting. Wouldn't it? That would be real. And people don't realize how silver is integral to those industries, to Tesla. And, you know, the, so this, this has a very wide range possibility. And it was started by a group of private citizens. Again, I keep going back to that because as you just mentioned, the institutional investors in the Wall Street Bank um, have become so arrogant. They've controlled this for so long. They've made so much money from it by stealing, basically, from the American people. Hundreds of trillions of dollars the Wall Street banks have taken. And it's all been not necessarily in precious metals, but in stocks naked short selling and, and all of the games that they play. And it's real interesting that now that citizens are coming out with legitimate purchases of uh, whether it was an organized situation, whether someone above them organized it, there's a question as how this all originated, mm -hmm. you know, to possibly 
affect the manipulation of the market, but it's real interesting that there's talk of punishment and violations toward the platforms which the private citizens have used. I mean, there's a big uproar, you know, it's being talked about in Congress and in banking and what kind of judicial action would could we take for private citizens purchasing silver? You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. it's a very interesting dynamic. The tables turned. I don't know if the manipulation could be halted because of this. They're way too strong, right, in their manipulation. It's possible. I mean, I'm in the camp of the for certainly I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I think one of the interesting things is, you know, it's just public that that's caught on to the silver story and they're buying silver. So what's wrong with purchasing, you know, something that you want to buy? And, and yet, if this goes against them and it really turns into a short squeeze, then what you're going to get out of the mainstream financial press and the mainstream press is, you know, us, we're the bad guys. So we're buying something that we want, something to preserve our wealth, something to protect us from the currency collapse, something that's uh, been money for eons. It's our fault for doing that. That's how the way it'll be spun, the spin group out there, spin meisters. Why are the whole time they're selling what they don't have and taking advantage of the public over and over again, never gets mentioned. So, you know, it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. I mean, I'm really on the side of this GameStop situation, meaning that, you know, what did I just said, the old acronym or the old analogy, but it's true, you know, and it should be fair and it should be free market and it should be the price determined by the supply and demand, but it's not because there's an infinite supply of paper silver. But if you call them on it, you call their bluff and you say, all right, I call you, show me your cards. In other words, show me all the silver that you can give us. Oh, that's all you have. And it's bought up and it's bought up double that as an example. I'm not saying that's the case. Then if double of it's bought and they sold naked that they can't cover, then we're going to basically expose the fraud because you cannot sell something that you don't own. The only way that you can is in these markets with cash in your account. And the only way out is to buy back your short, which is what happened with GameStop, which means that's how one, I guess one at least, I'm not that steady, and one or two hedge funds blew up because they sold it at 10 and had to buy it back at 200. They're taking a huge loss, but they're out of the obligation now. The obligation goes away. They've met it with cash. So we'll see. Uh, people are discouraged right now. Let me not make them discouraged. All indications between what's been purchased on the SLV, the PSLV making an announcement, the amount of retail demand and being backlogged for a product that has to be fabricated and sent out later, all those things indicate this market has ways to go to the upside. Whether it's 35, 40, 50, I don't know, but I do know it's not time to give up. Don't be discouraged on the day-to-day -day paper price. Hold your ground, be strong, be long, and take advantage of the fact that silver has protected wealth much better than any stock that's ever existed. So, uh, so let me finish with that. And if you've got another question, I'm ready. You know, I was just going to ask about uh, your best advice right now for everyone that's watching, people that have never, you know, tipped their toes into silver, because this could be a game changer. Um, you know, this first action might not cure all the manipulation of the precious metals market, but it sure wakes people up yeah. to the fact that, oh, we shook the boat a little bit and, you know, our artillery, you know, got pointed our direction. You know, why? You know, why yeah. are they reacting so fiercely toward people buying silver and they're literally talking about right and right. so people are like why are they doing this and so then they start to investigate and so the realization that a lot of people buying one thing that an institution has been shorting for a long long time could topple that whole structure and maybe that needs to happen well, the truth needs to come out. I mean, you know, my mission statement to teach and empower people to understand the benefits of an honest financial system. We haven't had, um, you know, the thing about GameStop, I keep saying that word, but it's important because this exposed it. I think silver, you know, the silver nuts 
you know, we've exposed it, but that's just such a small little group. And a lot of the uh, people that were game stoppers might have thought that, uh, you know, we're, we're conspiracy theorists. It doesn't really happen or they're making it up or whatever. But now the best outcome so far is that it's been exposed. The emperor has no clothes and everyone admits it. Ah, oh, the emperor has no clothes. So now what happens? Well, there's nothing better um, to take on than silver, in my view, because it's a much smaller market than gold. It's a public market. The banks don't hold any real supply. And all you're doing is asking to purchase something that you want to be able to hold that has monetary value. Uh, but again, they'll probably blame us. I'd say my advice would be read the 10 rules of silver investing. You don't have to go overboard. You don't want to put in your life savings. You don't want to chase the market too far. I mean, if this market goes to 100, you bought it 50, you double your money. I've always said 100 is achievable. Will we get there or not remains to be determined. Is it going to hit 600, 1,000, whatever? I don't know. What I do know is in a short squeeze, take a look at what happened to GameStop. And the authorities will have most of the power, even though they might not have most of the silver. It's probably right now where the people have most of the silver. Certainly the banks don't own very much. But They'll come out again. I know I'm repeating myself, but I don't want to make the point. They'll, they'll blame us. It's those nasty speculators who started it, those Reddit people, whatever. But the truth is, you guys made the market. You're the ones that said there's an infinite silver supply. What's the problem? You know, if it's infinity, we just want a little bit of it. What's the problem? So, and you, you articulate it probably better than me. And I know I'm being slightly emotional. I don't mean to be, but it's been a long dry spell for me as far as trying to tell people how much corruption there is. Now everyone sees the corruption. That's a big thing in our favor, whether it pours it in silver market, we break free or not, again, remains to be determined. If we hold our ground and keep buying on a continual basis and look at this as something we need to do to, let's say, the end of the year, I think it'll happen. If people give up, early or take profits. Hey, look, I made, you know, five times on my money or 10 times when they take the profits of currency. So be it. I'm free market. I'm not going to say don't do that. What I am going to say is if that's what takes place, then the silver market will stay corralled. The powers that be will have learned a lesson and probably won't short to the degree that they have in the past, but it will come back to conditions that have prevailed for a very long time. So they'll go back to controlling, manipulating the market. You know, um, it's real interesting. Yourself, um, Keith Newmeyer from uh, First Majestic. I mean, there are several very prominent people in this sector that have been saying, you know, ever since I got into it, that this is complete control and manipulation. And it's true. So many people and institutional investors, mainstream media, journalists, talk about the conspiracy theorists, that people, even the people that cover the markets, David, mm -hmm. you know, and supposedly know and have their name out there, talk about these are conspiracies. And it's just being proven that they're not. It's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, you pull back the curtain, you know, you have this big silver thing. Oh, we have all this silver. And it's just this little guy. and He's cheating everyone. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let me add on to that a little bit, because even within the gold silver community, you have people like that. And that's fine. But, you know, a great majority of the gold only bugs or precious metals bugs are like, well, gold's money, silver isn't. Well, Certainly silver is both an industrial commodity and I believe money and I, and it's legally money. Economically, it's not. Who's going to take a one ounce silver Eagle into Walmart and buy, you know, a pack of gum with it when it's worth, you know, 30 bucks at melt value and 50 bucks on Amazon right now. Right. But you could, and, and you could force the issue. In other words, if you put out a Silver Eagle on the counter at Walmart, they absolutely by law have to take it. Now, they might not know what to do with it, never seen it, be confused, be upset. All that could take place. It's all emotion, but the fact remains it's money. Anyway, back to the point is, let's just say it's only a commodity. Well, look what's happened to palladium. Palladium's gone from like the six, $700 range up to 2,200, and it stayed there at 2,200, which is quite a jump from 700. It's a 300% increase. And that's an industrial commodity. It could be money, classically. I won't go into that. But we'll just say it's an industrial commodity used for catalytic converters for gas engines primarily. That's all it is. 
it, and yet it tripled because of economic demand only, not monetary demand. So if silver were to just be in that situation where the amount of solar panels, uh, electric vehicles, uh, the electronics industry, electricity, uh, superconductivity, maglev trains, wood preservatives, uh, mirrors, you name it, you know, then would we have a problem, you know, if no investors were involved, what would happen then? So think about it. I'm just trying to give a thought experiment out here that, well, what's right or wrong here? You know, it's because investors want to buy silver. We're at fault. Well, no one's blaming the palladium price because of the investor demand. It's up that because it's only used in industry primarily. I mean, there's some investment in it, but it's minuscule. Anyway, my point is that uh, silver has two things going for it. It's got investment demand and it also has industrial demand. And uh, let's not, I don't know what the right way to, you know, remain calm and truthful that it's not our fault. It's your fault. In other words, you are the one, you meaning the exchanges and the bankers, the primary bullion dealers, the manipulators. all this hypothecation, all this nausea that anyone's followed silver knows about. New people are learning it. It's their fault for creating something out of nothing and pretending there's an infinite supply of silver when there isn't. And it's other things. It's not just silver. I mean, look at any commodity. I mean, there's an oversale of oil or lumber or cocoa or soybeans or soybean meal. But those are matters that are usually days of over, you know, oversupply. I mean, it's well within what I consider a legitimate hedging, but not with silver. With silver, it's astronomical. And that's, that could be their downfall. That's, that's their vulnerability. It's just, can we, the people, put enough pressure on them, the banks, that could create infinite currency, enough, you know, enough of a price increase where they're forced to cover? And I don't know. I don't know. I They've won possible. so many times in the past and are so used to winning. And plus, they'll you know, change things around. More margin, more margin, more margin. But if they get the margin up to the cash price, that's actually a benefit for us. Because now there is no futures market. And the price settles at $65 an ounce, let's say, as a talking point. At that price, industry's still going to buy it. That's peanuts to them because if you're building a $5,000 refrigerator, if you pay 30 bucks for an ounce of silver or 65, it makes little difference. What's $65 compared to 5,000, the end price? It's a very small percentage. So there's that. And then investors say, yeah, 65. You know, I'm going to buy it for the long term. And if we keep buying it, it's going to force the price higher. Any market moves up on buying pressure or moves down on selling pressure. Anyway, I probably over talked it, but no. it's exciting to see it happen. And, right. you know, if you would have asked me a year ago, will it ever happen? I've said consistent. I've tried to be consistent. Yes, it can happen. And I've actually said more or less it would. But it's not an easy market because of the way things are structured but it doesn't mean that enough fiscal buying won't. Do you think they'll stop it is, you know, people that say, hey, give me my currency. Here's your silver. And that's, you know, to be determined. We'll just have to find out. Well, it's always great to be with you, Michelle. Uh, Hi-ho, silver away. Uh, <laughs> don't uh, forget to circle back. <laughs> I definitely and, uh, will. <laughs> talk to me in a month or two and see where we're at. Exactly. David, before we go, tell everyone how to find your reports, your website, and follow your work. You bet. The best thing to do is go to the main website, themorganreport.com. Sign up for our free newsletter. If you're interested in the paid services, go to the subscribe button, read the sales letter, listen to the video. And then the best thing to do for the general public to be educated on this market, from at least my perspective and a lot of the interviews and writings that I do, is just go to the blog. Just hit the blog tab on the nav bar. And when you're on the blog, at the top, there's another nav bar on the blog page that shows our Twitter feed, our LinkedIn, our Facebook, our, our YouTube channel, which who knows, I've moved everything to the library. I need to make a video to show everybody. I forget the exact URL, but it's on the library domain. It's also on Odyssey. I think those two. So when we're taken down off of YouTube, which is probably imminent, uh, we still have everything that we've done for like 20 years on another platform. 
Oh, wow. You think you're going to get censored, too, having to do Well, I've had strikes already, and uh, I get letters from uh, Google. Uh, but uh, I don't know. But I'm planning. I'm, yeah. I'm prepared for it if, it if it occurs. Just in case. I stay pretty benign. But, you know, yeah. if all of a sudden the, um, the propaganda press starts demonizing silver investors, uh, there's one that's fairly well known. So... <laughs> Wow. They might take it off of Twitter. Who knows? Maybe <laughs> silver is hate speech. I mean, I don't know. These days, the whole world is upside down, right? It silver sure. shines light better. You know, silver reflects light better than anything known to man, right? So we're shining a little bit of truth. We're shining a lot of light on the truth about what these markets really are and how they really work. And that's uh, what uh, we I are think here. That's for. a good metaphor, maybe to end. But uh, beautiful. You know, if you're shining off too much truth, are you going to be shut down? I don't know. <laughs> probably sadly mr david morgan we will be back in about a month and find okay. out where these prices are precious metals expert and the founder of the morgan report.com for the industry experts panel i'm michelle holiday at portfolio wealth global.com